So this is a walk through the chapter 17 motion in a circle test. Uh, question 1 says the Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990 into a circular orbit near to the Earth. It travels around the Earth once every 97 minutes. Calculate the angular speed of the Hubble Telescope. Well, my first thought is I know the period, and so I would say my angular speed omega is 2 pi over t. I would take that from my data sheet, if I didn't already know it, of course. And uh, in sticking in my numbers, bearing in mind that I need to have my period in seconds, and you know, you've got three marks here, so it's not just a simple matter of plugging numbers from the question into an equation. Then you're going to get 2 pi divided by 97 times 60. And if you put it into your calculator correctly, you will get 1.1 times 10 to the minus 3 is the figure. And the units, of course, are radians per second or per second. We'll do there. So that's question one. Question two, figure one shows one type of playground roundabout. It consists of a rigid hollow metal ring supported by eight ropes arranged symmetrically around the ring. Two of the ropes are shown. The ring is of average radius 1.26 meters and has a mass of 27.0 kilograms. And I'm just picking up, I've got three sig figs here. The vertical distance from the ring to the hub where the ropes are attached is 3.60 meters. The metal ring is uniform and its weight is distributed evenly amongst the eight ropes. Calculate the tension in one of the ropes when the roundabout is stationary. And there are four marks for this. So I'm thinking the eight ropes, the tension in the eight ropes, is supporting the weight. And since the weight is vertical, it will be the vertical component of the tension that's supporting the weight. And so what I need is to calculate the vertical component for which I need the angle. So I need this angle in here between the rope and the vertical, which by geometry is the same as this angle in here between the rope and the vertical. So can I calculate this angle? Well, I know this angle is related to this distance and this distance. I know the vertical to be 3.6. I know the horizontal to be 1.26. And so I know tan theta, opposite over adjacent, is 1.26 divided by 3.6. So there's my first uh, thought. And then I'm going to say, well, it's t cos theta that I want. That is the component of the tension vertically. And I know that the tension in one rope will be one eighth of, uh, or the t cos theta will be one eighth of the total weight. So, because I have eight ropes. And so, sticking in my numbers, I'll get 35.1 newtons. So the trick there is just taking your time and then remembering that there are eight ropes, not one. So, moving on then to part B. The roundabout is set in motion. The metal ring freely rotates at a steady rate, so there's no, no friction, no air resistance here. Freely rotates at a steady rate in a horizontal plane about the thin pole. State and explain whether the tension in the rope changes. Well, the question sets out by saying the thing is stationary. And now it says it's moving in a circle. So what changes? 
If it's moving in a circle, there has to be a centripetal force. And therefore, the tension must have increased. So, two marks. You need a centripetal force, the tension must have increased to provide it. Question three. Before constructing a section of a roller coaster ride, a designer builds the model shown in figure two. The car is released at A and rolls down the track, entering the loop section at B. The loop section of the track has radius R. When the car reaches the top of the track at the position mark T, its speed is V. Explain how the toy car is able to remain on the track when it reaches T. Well, what could you say? The car has to be moving fast enough to, to make it round the loop. That's common knowledge. If you're not moving fast enough, then you won't make it up. And if you're moving fast enough to make it up, but not fast enough to keep going, you won't make it round. So it has to be moving fast enough there is a minimum velocity required uh, and I think later on yes we're, we're looking for an expression for the minimum uh, speed uh, as the car goes round past t. So we need to think carefully here to get our three marks. So it's moving in a circle so there must be a centripetal force that centripetal force, well, the weight at that point is acting down, so that would work. But if it was just the weight, then the car would be falling vertically rather than performing the circle, right? Because if the only vertical force was the weight, then that's falling under gravity. That's, that's what it is. So there must be a centripetal force greater than the weight. There has to be more force here. And of course, that's because the track is pushing against the car inwards. It is the reaction of the track on the car. There has to be a reaction, or in the limit, at the very smallest speed, the reaction falls to zero at the point of T. But there has to be that reaction from the track pushing inwards. If there's no reaction, the car is not in contact with the track in effect, uh, and therefore it is falling. So. One point that I can make here must be traveling fast enough. And if you think about the sort of level of that answer, pretty much every student's going to get that because that's almost common knowledge. So It has to be greater than or equal to the weight at the limit where the reaction falls to zero, the car, if it falls to zero at T, the car will just make it past as the reaction picks up then just beyond that. So uh, there's another thing that we can say. For our second mark, 
And what else could we say? Well, in order to get that large enough speed, then the GPE at A must be enough to provide the KE at B and therefore at T. And I think that covers that. So the car remains in contact with the track at T, show that the minimum speed which the car requires at T is given by that expression, B min is root GR. That doesn't come through terribly well, but it is uh, GR to the half. So, what are we going to say? Well, at this point generally, we have mg plus r is our centripetal force. So, where v is at its smallest, so we're saying, generally speaking, um, mg plus r equals mv squared over r but if v is as small as it can be r equals zero so now we have mg equals mv squared over r and so if you rearrange that you get v squared is mgr over m and then you cancel the m's to get v is the square root of gr so there's your expression uh, and that zero reaction that's that's an assumption if you like. Uh, uh, you could also say other well, forces acting because you'd have to include those in your expression if they were there. So there's part B. Question four then. I'm not going to be able to add arrows to this diagram any more than you were but Add to figure three, labelled arrows to show the weight, little w. Well, of course, the weight, little w, will come straight down. The reaction R of the wall, well, that's going to be horizontally inwards towards the centre of the cylinder. Frictional force F, well, the rider is trying to slide down and the friction is preventing that. So the friction will be up, vertically up, at the wall. And you need to consider, of course, these are vectors. So uh, because there is no vertical acceleration, the length of the arrow vertically up, labelled F, and the length of the arrow vertically down, labelled little w, need to be the same. Explain why there is a minimum rotational speed required to ensure that the rider remains pinned to the wall when the floor is dropped. Well, if you think about it, it is the friction vertically upwards that is providing that uh, equilibrium uh, vertically. Obviously, there isn't an equilibrium horizontally because it's accelerating, but that, that vertical uh, stationary state um, 
is as a consequence of the friction and the weight being balanced, no resultant along that line. And the friction, of course, depends on the reaction. The reaction, of course, depends on the velocity, the speed. And so, as you slow the rotation down, the reaction falls, the friction falls, and as a consequence, there is a minimum speed below which the rider will not remain stationary in that position. So that's the, the sense of it. So centripetal force divided by the reaction of the, what are we calling it? Uh, rotor on the rider. The friction depends on the magnitude of the reaction. The reaction is proportional to, that was not supposed to look like that. Reaction is proportional to uh, V squared So as V falls R falls and F as capital F falls meaning that there is a minimum value of V which allows the writer to remain in position. Obviously when the floor is in place the reaction of the floor plus the friction uh, is equal to the weight. So there is your answer to that, which might look better in bold. Okay. Question five then. We're nearly there. Just five and six to do. Figure four shows a car on a roller coaster track. The car is initially at rest at A and is lifted to the highest point on the track B, 35 meters above A. The car with its passengers has a total mass of 550 kilos. It takes 25 seconds to lift the car from A to B. It then starts off with negligible velocity and moves unpowered along the track. The speed reached by the car at C, the bottom of the first dip, is 22 meters per second. The length of the track from B to the bottom of the first dip C is 63 meters. Calculate the average resistive force acting on the car during the descent for four marks. So I'm thinking if there is a resistive force, then the force will be doing work. I will know how much work is done because the amount of work done is the amount of energy converted. So the difference between the GPE at B and the KE at C will be the work done by the frictional force. And the work done is force times distance and I know the distance. So those are my thoughts. Then you have to see whether it works. So I'm going to say, well, my uh, 
loss of energy would be the uh, GPE at B, which would be the mass, 550, times G, 9.81, times uh, height, 35 meters, would be that, minus a half times the mass, 550, times V squared, which is 21, no, 22 meters per second. Let's put that in brackets, otherwise it's going to look a bit odd, I think. Let me make that a bit bigger. Let's make that a lot bigger. Let's get our squared in there. So, how does that come out? Well, that's 189 minus 133 kilojoules. So the this equals the work done by the resistive forces. And we're not being fussy about this. It's friction, it's air resistance. And we're looking for the average value, remember. We're not looking for an instantaneous value. Obviously, the values are going to change with the, the speed of the vehicle. So uh, that equals the force, average force, times distance. So then we're going to say uh, 189 minus 133. which gives us 56 kilojoules equals the force times, and how far was it? 63 meters. So our force then is 56,000 divided by 63, which gives us uh, 888.88 Too many sig figs. What do we need? We need two or three. Strictly it should be two because that's two, that's two, that's two, although we're not using that right now. Uh, and that's three. So we should give it to two. And so I would say 8.9 times 10 to the 2 newtons. Putting a standard form, as I've said before, means you can't really go wrong. Every number you write down is significant. If I wrote down 8.90, that would be three sig figs. So, 890, 888.888 uh, newtons. Explain why the resistive force is unlikely to remain constant. Well, uh, the reaction will change as the uh, radius of the track curvature changes. As the position on the track changes, clearly the reaction here will not be the same as the reaction here. Uh, the air resistance changes with the speed of the car. So well, that's, that's it really. Question C for three marks. A passenger of mass 55 kilos experiences an upward reaction of 2160. So this is at C. 2160 newtons when the speed is 22 meters per second. Calculate the radius of curvature of the track 
at C. Assume the track is a circular arc at this point. So at this point, we have a force of 2160 reaction, right? And the resultant of the forces on the rider at this point is the centripetal force. So we have the resultant inwards, 2160, minus the weight of the rider. That's our centripetal force. So we're going to say 2160 minus the mass is 55 times 9.81 gives us the weight. That's the centripetal force. And that, of course, is mv squared over r. mv squared divided by r. Let's put that in the numbers actually. So we've got 55 times v squared, which is uh, 22 squared divided by r, r being what we want. So that gives us r equals. Fifty-five times twenty-two squared divided by two one six zero minus fifty-five times nine point eight one. And if we do that right, then we get sixteen point four meters small m. If you do it wrong in that you don't consider the weight, you'll get a radius of twelve meters. So that'll cost you a mark. You'll get two if you're getting this far, but then you won't have the right answer. Okay, so possibly you got caught out by that. You just need to think very carefully about every question you do. This is not GCSE. I know you're tired of hearing me say that. But this is not GCSE, and you have to think carefully. Finally, then, here's a very familiar question to you, I hope. A van on a humpback bridge. Draw arrows on figure six below to show the forces that act on the parcel as it passes over the highest point of the bridge. Well, you're going to have uh, an arrow showing the reaction R vertically up and MG vertically down, and they should be collinear. Now, R, if you're being fussy about it, and I would be, R comes from the floor of the van, so that's where R should begin. MG comes from the center of mass, and I'm going to say that's the middle, and it comes down from there. Of course, it might not be. Real parcels don't necessarily have their center of mass in the middle. However, that's what I would draw. And they need to be collinear because, of course, if they're not collinear, then we have this moment going on as well. So write down an equation that relates the contact force R between the parcel and the floor to MVR and the gravitational field strength G. Well, the difference between MG and R is the centripetal force and there's your expression then we need to calculate the value of r given those numbers so If we stick in our numbers then, rearrange and stick in our numbers, 
mg minus r is mv squared over r, so r is mg minus mv squared over r. So that's taking this over there and then changing the sign to get plus r. Rearranging, simplifying, and then substituting, we get 55, 54.6 would be the answer. Uh, and we have two sig figs, so 55 newtons. Now you're going to weigh with 54.6 three sig figs because it doesn't ask you for the right number of sig figs, but you should always be looking to do it right. So 55 newtons. 6b then, explain what would happen to the magnitude of r if the van passed over the bridge at higher speed. Well, as the speed increases, the centripetal force required has to increase, sorry, it does increase, and therefore what is supplied has to increase. The only way that can happen is if r gets smaller. So r decreases uh, and if you do your calculation uh, you'll find that uh, at 15 meters per second r equals uh, 0.33 newtons. So anything more than 15 meters per second and r is going to fall to zero. And so uh, anything more than 15, uh, then the car will not be able to follow the circle. So there it is.